Welcome back to Nonfiction for Life, the podcast with authors who write compelling true stories and books with great ideas for living well. I'm your host, Janet Perry, and today we'll be talking to Courtney Carver, author of Soulful Simplicity, How Living with Less Can Lead to So Much More. During this time of year, you may be taking stock of what you have surrounding you. Should you start lightening up your house by getting rid of things? It's very common for those of us who have spent a year working hard to think, what are we going to do differently? Did you know that over half of Americans are living beyond their means and 78% live paycheck to paycheck? 90% purchase things they can't afford. But to what end? We've all heard the old adage that you can't buy happiness, so why do we have and feel the need to have so much stuff? Courtney Carver in 2010 had a big wake-up call when she was diagnosed with MS and had to face the idea that maybe she was running too hard towards material things. She launched a blog called Be More With Less, and now she's one of the top bloggers in the world on the subject of minimalism. She's been featured in countless articles, podcasts, and interviews on simplicity. And she's the creator of the Minimalist Fashion Challenge Project 333, which was featured in O Magazine and Real Simple. Today, we're really pleased to talk to Courtney Carver about her book that was just released December 26, 2017. The book is Soulful Simplicity, How Living with Less Can Lead to So Much More. Welcome to the program, Courtney. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Janet. Thanks for having me. Let's just jump right in and have you define what soulful simplicity means. Is it more than just another term for minimalism? I think it is. When I think about minimalism or simplicity, I often think about the external first, so the, the clutter and the stuff. And my soulful simplicity has really transformed me outside and inside. So really simplifying, you know, what's running around in my brain and what I'm holding on to with my heart and really connecting with my heart. I think that is what makes the biggest difference. Hmm. So does it always equate to less, like less stuff, less time spent at work and so forth? It looks different for everyone, but less is definitely part of the equation because I think we can all agree that we've got way too much going on, whether it be clutter or calendar stuff or things on our to-do list. So yes, I think less is often the answer and how that plays out for each person is going to be a little bit different. I like that you're bringing in um, less things to do. So sometimes we think of less stuff, but you seem to bring in this idea that we're, we need to do less. So I think at this point, it might be really helpful for our listeners to hear some of your personal background and how you came to this place of simplicity. Maybe to get you started, you can explain the title of your introduction, which you call Wanting More. What did you want more of and how did you finally discover why you wanted it? Well, I didn't know what I wanted then. But I often uh, went to more as the default answer, especially in my kind of mid-20s when I was very deep in debt in an unhappy marriage and raising a little girl by myself. And the, the relief for me was more spending, which led to more working, um, which led to more stress. And then I would need more money. It it always seemed like I needed more. But when I really stepped back, and this took me a long time to figure out, I did not figure it out in the moment. But looking back, um, I wanted more love and more time and freedom and adventure. But that was so hard to measure. So instead, I focused on the easy to measure stuff. And that really... Um, brought me to, I don't know, hard times in terms of doing too much um, and trying to keep up with everything and do it all and make it look like I was doing it all very uh, happily and well, which I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And that eventually led to some major burnout, which I think a lot of people can really relate to. Mm -hmm. 
I, I think we can relate to this stuff too. So you're a big proponent now of living with less stuff. So maybe because that's easier to measure, may, why don't we talk about that a little bit? How do we convince ourselves that we need less stuff? I don't think we have to really convince ourselves. I just think we have to give ourselves a chance to see what it's like. So I don't recommend that people get rid of all of their things by any means, but perhaps uh, lightening things up a little bit by getting some things out of sight for a while, because I find that we're really emotionally attached to our things. And even if we don't use them or they don't add value to our life, we hold on to them because uh, of many reasons, either uh, they have sentimental value or we worked really hard to afford those items or we think we might need them someday just in case. Um, lots of different reasons for holding on. But if we could just remove that emotional connection, then we can think about whether or not we really want the stuff in the first place. Hmm. And so I often hide things before I let them go. And it's surprising how often I forget what I've hidden. Uh, once it's out of sight and out of mind, I realize that I <clears throat> didn't need it in the first place. Mm -hmm. You know, there's another step to this that I that you bring up that I think is really interesting. You call it letting go. And this isn't necessarily letting go of things. Of course, we do need to get rid of things. Um, but how is letting go different? from getting rid of things, what else should we let go of? Well, letting go of our things is really good practice for letting go of other non-thing things. So for instance, um, letting go of, of a way of thinking so that you've, you, maybe you've been thinking a certain way, it hasn't been working for you, letting that go letting go of what other people might think about you and what you do on any given day. I think we spend way too much time focused on that versus how we really want to live our lives. Um, we're, we're very focused on how we're supposed to live our lives or what we should do or what other people expect us to do. Um, when if we can get back to ourselves and remember who we are, get back to our hearts, we can start doing what we enjoy and in the long run, that usually ends up better for everyone around us as well. Mm -hmm. And and you talk about these feelings in the book. You bring that into the equation. You talk about joy, but you also talk about feelings of frustration and exhaustion, trying to keep up, feelings of success. But I'd really like you to talk about the feeling uh, of guilt because that seems to be very tied in to, to this process of simplifying Interestingly, you say, quote, guilt doesn't usually come from letting go. It comes from holding on. Can you explain for our listeners that concept and the relationship between guilt and soulful simplicity? Yes, I think that living with less guilt certainly can benefit anyone. Uh, guilt typically doesn't have any positive outcome, but yet we still hold on to it pretty tightly. And especially when it comes to letting go of our things, uh, we feel guilty because of some of those reasons I mentioned before. Maybe we've spent too much money on it. Uh, but what I found, especially when I was letting go of items in my closet, is that once they were gone, the guilt went with it. And so the letting go wasn't making me feel guilty. It was seeing it every day, you know, looking at my bad purchase decisions, at my closet full of clothes that was a constant reminder of my debt and discontent, that made me feel guilty. Mm. When it was gone and I had taken a step in the right direction, the guilt went with it. Wow, that's fascinating. Well, let's move to technology. I've asked other authors to share their advice on how to deal with technology, and I'd like to know your take on controlling our devices rather than letting them control us. This plays into the kind of lifestyle that you're, that you're a proponent of. Specifically, how can we manage our emails and texts and notifications without being Luddites, but also leaving time and space for quiet time and connections with real people? 
think the most important thing to do in this case is not to dive into the tech world first thing in the morning. So if we start the day on Facebook or in email, usually we never come out. But if we take a few hours in the morning to fuel ourselves first and to perhaps do the work that matters to us before we get into our inbox, which is often you know, someone else's to-do list, it's really helpful. But if you start there, it's really hard to back out um, later in the morning or mid-afternoon. And then I also think it's really helpful to have uh, digital sabbaticals. So whether that's uh, one hour a day or one day a week, whatever it is that you can do to have blocks of time where you're not using any uh, digital devices, I think that's really helpful. It lets you come back to it um, with a little more clarity and less distraction. Hmm. Another thing that we have to... Uh, be stewards over is our money and money might be at the heart of many of our decisions where we where to work what kind of house we have and a myriad of other daily decisions but um, by now you've gone through many of those decisions and I want to focus on our homes so to get out of debt you and your husband made a decision to downsize from a big home to was it an apartment I believe we actually got out of debt before we did that um we we made a decision to become debt free prior to moving, but that kind of put us over the edge by getting rid of our our house debt, our home mortgage. Um, but the rest of our debt we did before that move, and we did that for several reasons. I mean, yes, we wanted to get rid of the mortgage, but we also wanted to stop investing in in a home and a life that we really weren't thrilled with. I mean, we didn't want to keep taking care of a big house and, and lawn and garage and attic. Uh, we wanted to travel on the weekends or go skiing or hiking or be able to take a walk and not worry about the upkeep of a big property. So living in a smaller space really works for us. And it's not just the money, it's also the time, you know, all the things that we invest when we own something like that. So money and time come back to you from scaling and back. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, and energy. Interesting. Well, let's continue on this idea of having to be stewards of our money. You warn us about accumulating things, saying when you need to buy things for your things, it's time for fewer things. <laughs> so to keep us from over-purchasing, you suggest trading shopping habits for self-care. Tell us how that works. Sure. And, and let me just say that I was the, the queen of overspending. And for many, many years, uh, shopping and spending, that was the way that I thought I was taking care of myself, the way that I thought I was relieving stress. Uh, when I, in actuality, I was adding to it. And so when I realized that and started to cut back while we were paying down debt, I tried to think of other ways to address those feelings that I had of boredom or frustration or um, disappointment, the things that made me want to go shopping and thought about how I could take better care of myself in those moments. And it came back to self-care. So taking a walk or going for a hike. Um, getting a massage or doing a yoga practice, taking a bath or a nap, things that I never thought I had time for. But once I stopped that kind of vicious cycle of spending all the money I was making um, to make myself feel better for working a job that I didn't enjoy, I had more time mm -hmm. and could take better care of myself. And I can tell you that all of those things feel better than shopping ever did. Mm -hmm. Years ago, a friend who'd spent a lifetime buying and accumulating things said to me, our possessions possess us. So do you have any other guiding principles that you can share that might help help us keep our possessions in perspective? We obviously need some possessions, but how can we keep them in perspective? Well, I'd say that you're right. I mean, less isn't nothing. We may choose to have some things in our life. 
Um, but we have to be thoughtful about what those things are and how they add value and ask ourselves why, why we own them. Yeah. And when it comes to the letting go and how challenging we think that is, you know, we talk about letting go as hard and it's a struggle, but we never talk about holding on and, and how hard that is. And I think holding on is actually harder because we have to hold on every day and we're not just holding on to the stuff, but we're holding on with our time and our money and our attention. But when we let go, we only have to let go once. I was re- speaking of holding on. I was really fascinated that you learned to let go, uh, to stop holding on to things that were really personal, you know, letters that you'd written or letters you'd received and things that weren't purchased at a store. So maybe you can describe how to do that. Yes. So I didn't start there. I don't start, didn't start with the sentimental items because I knew they were going to be really challenging. And I wanted to kind of build up my muscles and tolerance for releasing those things. But when it was time, I I did things like uh, take pictures of some of the items. And I also realized that when I was holding on to all of it, I couldn't appreciate any of it. All of these sentimental items were in a box and I wasn't enjoying any of them. But when I started to pare down and let them go, I was able to honor some of the memories that those items held by displaying them. Or, I mean, one example I can think of is when a a few years after my grandparents had both passed away, I had gone through a box of photos of them from over the years. And I realized I never really looked at the photos And I found this one picture of the two of them in their 20s. And my grandmother was sitting on my grandfather's lap and he was kind of dipping her back and they were laughing and looking at each other. And I kept thinking, this is how I want to remember them. And I can only hope that they are this happy somewhere together right now. Mm. And it it helped me to let go of all the other photos. And I took that one image and created a bookmark laminated a few bookmarks so that whenever I read a book I can have a glimpse of them and and trigger those memories I didn't need a whole box of photos to do that I think you adopted another strategy from somebody called the victory lap yes uh, my friend Sarah from a site a website called yes and yes dot org she uh, gave me this great idea to take your sentimental items on a victory lap before you let them go. And an example that she gave was uh, a dress that someone had given to her. I believe it was her aunt that she didn't wear or really appreciate, but she loved it because her aunt gave it to her, but she knew it was time to let go. So she had a party and wore it to the party and ha- gave it its victory lap. Uh, and I think she did something similar with a fondue pot and some other items. And then she was able to let them go. Yes. That's nice. Well, another, one thing that we can accumulate quickly without really knowing that we're doing it is clothing. We can do it piece by piece, here a, the, here a little, there a little. And you took a very specific approach to creating a smaller wardrobe but and you didn't do it alone in in 2010 on your blog you invited others to join you in what now is known as project 333 tell us about that project and what surprises you found along the way i created minimalist fashion challenge project 333 in 2010 uh, because i needed a shakeup for my closet And I knew my slow and steady approach to change was not going to work on my closet. It was really out of control. And I created some rules uh, where I would dress for three months with 33 items, including clothes, jewelry, shoes, and accessories, and invited uh, people who read my blog to join in. 
and now it's been a, a little over seven years. I still practice Project 333, and tens of thousands of people from around the world have a, tried it as well. And that's surprising for starters. <laughs> but what I've learned uh, in the process has been surprising. I mean, one thing is that no one cares what I'm wearing. Mm. So for many years, I tried to prove who I was by what I was wearing. And all of those efforts went unnoticed. Because when I started this challenge and I was wearing the same things over and over again, I was still working full time. And no one I worked with ever noticed. Mm. That was shocking. What kind of feedback have you got from your um, followers? That they have easier mornings, they're saving money, um, they're happier, uh, they're experiencing less anxiety or depression in some cases. Wow. It's really, it's, it's a very powerful challenge. And it, in the end, has very little to do with the clothes. So it's every three months you change out your wardrobe. Is that I correct? Don't, I, don't, I don't change out everything, but I do swap some things in and out for the, for the seasons. Okay. And you so keep it to 33 30, things. About 33, yeah. And about 50% of the items move forward until the next round. Hmm. So do you ever buy clothes anymore? I do. Yes. Uh, I buy clothes if uh, something doesn't fit or wears out or um, gets stained or ruined in some way. Hmm. But I don't shop for events anymore. Um, and I don't shop for emotion anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, we've talked a lot about things our possessions, but I want to talk about time now because that's another big element in our lives that can either contribute or take away from our soulful simplicity. And you give suggestions to help us slow down and appreciate the moments in our lives. One of them is to spend 21 days doing a busy boycott, which is agreeing to not mention how busy we are because that seems to be a habit. And the final step in that agreement is to reclaim the lost art of lingering longer. What does lingering look like? Why do you want us to reclaim it? How does it lead to soulful simplicity? Just saying the word linger makes me smile and feel relaxed. And just saying the word busy makes me feel stressed and anxious. So right there, uh, I can think of a thousand reasons why we should linger more, but I think we've, and when I say we, I don't mean everyone, but I think a lot of us have forgotten to slow down and enjoy things along the way. You know, we spend more time making dinner than eating it, for instance. Uh, we're always in a hurry, in a rush, trying to tick off that next thing on the to-do list. So if we make a, a conscious effort to linger longer, then perhaps we can take a walk after dinner instead of rushing to get the dishes done. Um, I just think lingering is the, is the solution perhaps to busyness. Mm -hmm. You had a pretty serious wake up call many years ago that started all this and uh, you were diagnosed with MS. And looking back, you say simplicity wasn't the plan. There was no plan. All I wanted to do was get better. And certainly your healing through simplifying has come in stages rather than all at once. What are some of the mistakes you've learned uh, along the way with this journey? I'm thinking about that because I don't know if there have been a lot of mistakes. I think the mistakes that I made were earlier the changes that I tried to make before the fast and furious transformations um, or the changing for the wrong reasons I mean when I went into the changes that I've made over the past 10 years they've been really intentional and they've been very slow and steady and I've been very connected to why I'm making the change so I, I realized by doing this that 
the changes I made before didn't stick because there were usually superficial reasons for change. And once I got serious about it and was committed to it and felt like my heart was in the game, the change was enjoyable. So I, I wish I had a story about how I gave something away that I wish I didn't or I made a change that I wish I, I didn't, but really it's been a really fun learning experience overall. Um, it sounds like all your efforts have moved you in the direction you wanted to go. Yeah, they have, but to be honest, I haven't really focused on the end result. So it hasn't been a goal to get to a certain place, mm -hmm. which has been wonderful because then I don't measure the success of it on the end goal and I'm much more flexible where if something isn't working, I'm not tied to that because I said I was going to do it that way or because I think this is the way I have to go to get to this place I want to be. Uh, instead, it's been much more flexible and gentle. Mm. I didn't want it to be a stressful journey because the whole point was to get rid of stress. So mm -hmm. if I you know, tied myself to ridiculous goals or you know, work to the point of burnout to make these things happen, it, it would have been completely opposite of what I needed. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of a quote at the end of your book. You say, we don't remove clutter, reduce stress, and boycott busyness to have a simple life. We do it to have a life. I love that. You, um, you know, some of our listeners may be feeling inspired to have a life again or improve the life they already have and make a similar journey but they may not know quite where to start. What would you recommend as a first step? Give yourself permission to start small. So often when we look at the changes we have to make, they feel so overwhelming. Um, like I remember when I was decided to become debt free, I knew it was going to take years. And that felt almost not possible. But just by taking the small step to commit to becoming debt-free, I felt better. And then the next small step, which was, you know, to really take a good look at our finances, I felt a little horrified, but then better that I was moving in the right direction. And I realized that all of these really big changes that I've made in my life are just a combination of hundreds and thousands of tiny little steps. So be okay with taking one little step and then taking one little step the next day and the day after that because they will add up. I'd like to wrap this up with you talking more about the heart. It sounds like you're talking about following your heart, but you have a little exercise you do in the morning and even throughout the day occasionally. Can you describe that to our listeners and, and uh, tell us how that fits in with this idea of s not just simplicity, but soulful simplicity? Sure. Well, I, I do this heart practice during my morning routine, um, usually after meditating or writing a little bit. And it's just a way to really stay connected to myself and to remind myself that my voice matters and that I can trust what I, what I hold in my heart. And so I, I sit quietly and I put one hand over the other on my heart as if I'm literally holding my heart in my hands. And some days I just sit quietly like that and really feel the connection. And other days I ask questions of my heart, of myself. And I'll ask sometimes very simple things like, how are you? Or sometimes I'll ask questions about a decision that I'm making or something that I'm planning. And I like having that check-in place uh, and having it be within me because then I don't have to rely on a lot of extra opinions or uh, try to search out validation for believing in something that I believe in. Uh, I trust myself. And it it took me some time to get there. It's not like I sit down every, every day with my hands on my heart and all the answers come flooding out. Some days there are no answers. 
but just that I'm willing to show up for it matters and it has an impact on my day and my life. Well, thank you very much for talking with us today and sharing your, your story and lots of good ideas. Thank you. You've been listening to Courtney Carver. Her book is Soulful Simplicity, How Living with Less Can Lead to So Much More. I'm your host, Janet Perry, and this has been another episode of the Nonfiction for Life podcast, where we feature books that are insightful, inspiring, and uplifting. If you like what you've heard, be sure to sign up for the podcast, subscribe in any of your favorite podcast platforms. Remember, at Nonfiction for Life, we believe there's something for everyone.